Um, and it is entirely different in concept. So it's not about building a center here that is going to be rich and famous in its own right. We intend to bring rich and riches and fame to the New York community. So essentially every project we're going to do here is being distributed out to the academic institutions and hospitals around us. And we will take uh, projects from the surrounding institutes and bring them here as a, cool, uh, uh, a sort of a, uh, a hub and spoke model where we can connect projects like the ones you'll hear about with Wilson with other interested investigators at Columbia or Albert Einstein and so on. So I really like this idea that genetics with the flood of data that you all know that we are suffering and enjoying at the same time um, is a different kind of science. It's much more physics-like and I'm committed to the idea of making a different kind of institution here that is uh, interdisciplinary and interinstitutional at its very nature. And because I'm a physician scientist, like it or not, people, I'm interested in human disease. So in that context, I really am happy to have Golson here. And Golson uh, had a, a master's in genetics from the University of Cambridge and then came here to New York. We did an MD-PhD in the Rockefeller uh, Memorial Wild Cornell Tri-Institutional MD-PhD program. He worked with a chemist, Tom Muir, um, and then uh, from there went on to do uh, a series of interesting uh, journeys which landed him in, in a number of different places. But in particular, um, he ended up in Utah to do genetics where he's uh, founded a um, Utah Genetics Institute there. His particular interest is in psychiatry. He got boarded in psychiatry at Columbia University after leaving Rockefeller. So, his focus is on neuropsychiatrics uh, and genetics. Um, and he has moved to do that at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where he's been for the last two years, and so uh, where he's currently a principal investigator. So, Golson, pleasure to have you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So, is this is on? Can you hear me? So, the microphone's working? Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Bob and others here at New York Channel Center for inviting me. And um, this is a, a different sort of, this is a totally new talk for me. And I decided to sort of talk about um, a little bit broader things than I typically talk about. Um, and just before I start though, I just, there's been a large number of people, not all of whom are listed here, that I've worked with over the last five years uh, in Utah as well as at Companies such as Onisha, University of Utah, people at Illumina, people at uh, Cold Spring Harbor more recently, uh, the Utah Foundation for Biomedical Research is a foundation that Reed Robison and I started to enable collection of large numbers of families in uh, the state of Utah. Kai Wang and David Middleman are close uh, colleagues and collaborators of mine as well. Um, in the last three years or so, I've worked uh, intensively with several people in my laboratory, and I wanted to sort of publicly say thank you to Jason Arau and Han Fang, who are analysts in my lab, Yang Wu, who is a graduate student, and Max Durfel is a postdoc in the lab. Uh, I do have two conflicts of interest. Uh, I recently agreed to serve on the advisory board of, of medical advisory board of Gene Peaks, uh, which is a company, and I also recently agreed to serve on the advisory board for Omisha, However, I do not receive any compensation for this activity, um, and, and the, only, the only salary that I take is from Colston Harbor Laboratory. Um, so my lab has uh, originally has been focused mainly for the last five years on, on rare diseases. Uh, I am a, a psychiatrist by training, uh, but specifically also a child psychiatrist, and so I've used uh, my child psychiatry as a way to get into uh, things uh, into working with children with autistic features, developmental delay, uh, other sorts of disorders. And here I'm just showing some of the families that we've worked with, including um, two boys that were originally in Ogden, Utah. Uh, more recently, two brothers that, um, that are shown here at, at different uh, age points. This is the uh, just over a few years duration. This Chinese family that we've recently been working with 
uh, this particular individual and this this individual. Um, and the families have given me permission to show show these pictures. But you know, the, the idea is that I, I work on rare diseases that have obvious um, sort of craniofacial or other developmental uh, characteristics, which makes it much easier to sort of um, really categorize and, and, and get the phenotype uh, correct. Uh, and so um, one family in Utah that, uh, that we started working on was this with this very rare disease, and um, you know, that these boys over several generations, there's been five of these boys that have this very uh, characteristic appearance with um, loose, sort of loosened skin, large eyes, uh, very uh, different, you know, other things with uh, the way their lips and uh, lips are shaped. And sometimes they're, they're referred to by the family as the, uh, they're little old men. They have this sort of aged appearance. Um, and we also found this, after we did sequencing and we had found a mutation that seemed to segregate perfectly with the disease, we used that as a way to find another family that had the exact same mutation that had the same exact uh, phenotype. And so um, one thing about phenotype, you know, as a clinical person is um, that you know, this sort of phenotype is much easier to characterize and discern than somebody who comes in and says, you know, my child has um, autism or Tourette syndrome or obsessive compulsive disorder. And it, when they don't have any craniofacial or other uh, features, those syndromes, as I'll discuss later, are much, much harder to uh, discern. And there's lots more chances of getting what we call phenocopies. Um, where you may have things that look similar to the disease that you're trying to understand the genetic basis of, but they have a whole totally different uh, genetic architecture. So, you know, this family, um, two families, uh, which are, by the way, unrelated families, so there was no founder effect. This was two independently arising mutations in these two unrelated families that both gave rise to this very characteristic phenotype. And, uh, we published this paper and we named the disease Ogden Syndrome in honor of where the first family lives in, in Ogden, uh, Utah. And you know, my lab has uh, you know, taken two different directions. One direction is a sort of much more classical approach is you know, once you find a rare disease, you go deep on that rare disease. You start to do lots of biochemistry and functional analysis and you really try to prove, well, what is this mutation doing? Um, and and, 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 and that's one thing that we have been doing quite a lot of. Um, in, in addition, just, just, just to go back, um, something that's been particularly gratifying um, is that this younger um, daughter of, of has, you know, we were able, in a CLIA certified, in a clinical grade facility, we were able to demonstrate that she was wild type and did not have this mutation. And so she's recently um, decided to go ahead and, and get pregnant. And it's possible in the future um, that uh, the that that we will sequence this individual, this other girl is wild type as well, and this one has not yet been tested. Uh, she's quite young, but in the future, one could imagine that she might, um, you know, get tested. And if she is a carrier for the mutation of this X-linked uh, disorder, where the carrier women are unaffected but pass it on to their to the to the boys, then you know she could um, decide what she wants to do. And there are lots of uh, ways that, lots of things that one could do um, to decide uh, about having a child with that disease and if the child is born, be able to do the sequencing at birth and, and be able to implement preventive measures that might help um, the, the, with the child. It's, that's actually been probably the most gratifying thing, actually, is that uh, to be able to um, help the family understand the, the sort of course of the disease <coughs> in the event that there is a future child born with this disease, uh, the family will sort of be able at birth to know that that child has has um, that mutation, and therefore they can implement um, measures that they never they were not able to implement previously. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to. So we have a paper that we are currently writing up that has you know basically three years of analysis, which I'm, I've decided not to go through this story with you tonight. I'm just going to have one slide <laughs> about this where you know we've basically done. An enormous amount of proteomics analysis, a lot of in vitro biochemistry, a lot of you know immunoprecipitation, a lot of cellular analyses. We've taken this 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 mutation that's in this amino terminal acetyltransferase. It turns out it's conserved all the, this pathway is conserved all the way down to the yeast, 
And so we've done lots of experiments with yeast strains, and we've humanized the strains and put the human genes in place of the yeast genes. Uh, we've also done a, a lot of growth uh, analysis. We've moved into C. elegans and done some experiments uh, with RNAi of, of this pathway in C. elegans. And most recently, um, we have um, built uh, an induced pluripotent stem cell facility, and we've it seems uh, successfully made iPS cells from one of these boys, and we're beginning to uh, differentiate them down neuronal and cardiac lineages in order to sort of try to characterize the phenotype in more detail. Um, and so I'm not, I'm only telling you that little story as a way to say that every time you find a rare mutation or you have, you, there's enormous amounts of functional and biochemical follow-up that one must do, and, and that's something that we are actively doing for that disease as well as at the first slide that I show with those other rare diseases, we have found many mutations in those families as well that we are beginning to um, characterize and follow up as well. Um, but, but the title that I decided to go with today was, you know, this is the New York Genome Center and I wanted to sort of talk about, um, you know, things relevant to um, whole genome sequencing and trying to disseminate that to the clinical setting. And, you know, there are uh, many major barriers that um, just taking the tour today and walking to the center and then talking to um, Bob and others, like, I, I agree that this is a very different place and, and the vision that, that's, that's being articulated here um, is, is, is something that could at least begin to help break down some of these barriers because the, the current academic um, silo mentality is, is very, it, it's harder for me to imagine being able to, to conquer these things in the current sort of academic uh, medical environments. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, you, it takes a lot of collaboration to advance the current technology and knowledge, but also to reach out and educate the public, educate physicians about genetics, educate the, the, the populace about genetics, and even to sort of educate about prevention. So if you, in the family with Ogden syndrome, you know, there's been a lot of education of the families saying, well, this is what an X-linked disease is, and this is what the mutation is, and you know, you're, you, this woman is wild type, and this woman is not, and there's this thing called pre-implantation pre genetic diagnosis, and so there's been an enormous amount of education of the family, um, and that has uh, been incredibly rewarding, uh, and, but you know, it's been interesting that you know, the insurance companies have been reluctant to even, for a while they were reluctant to pay for the, the CLIA certified test, and so you have to sort of get into educating the insurance companies and the payers and the government. And you also have to sort of realize that our entire society is focused on um, treatment. So you either, you, you know, once you get a disease, so the, the Ogden syndrome boys, all five of them, they were born, they were all in the hospital like multiple times, they were all in the ICU, Hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on um, on treating these children, and it would have been nice. And they all primarily had pneumonias from uh, aspirations, and it, we're, we're still trying to understand the mechanism of that. But you know, all five of these boys had substantial aspiration pneumonias, and if one could sequence and know at birth that this child has Ogden syndrome, then you could um, basically at the very at the beginning of life could not be feeding the child liquids and other things that are going down and getting into their lung, you could instead um, go ahead and right away do other things to, to try to make them not have aspiration pneumonia. And you might then um, either prolong their life or at least prevent so many incredibly expensive ICU uh, hospitalizations. And the same thing is with, with cancer. I mean, we have known for <coughs> at least 20 years, 15 to 20 years, about um, high penetrance or high effect size mutations and breast cancer genes, and yet you know, we had not really um, screened uh, the entire populace for those mutations by any means, and so there's a lot of breast cancer prevention that's not, that's not being done at the moment. And I sort of have written about this in, um, in this paper from a couple of years ago, and, and you know, in the review of this manuscript as well as going around, I, you know, I realized that these are incredibly uh, complicated problems, and, and it was interesting, Hank really just gave a, uh, I, I just watched him, this guy from Stanford, give a talk, and he actually put his uh, money down and said that he thought that in the next 15 uh, years that there would be um, whole genome sequencing in all of the electronic medical records, and 
uh, that was really remarkable to hear him say. Um, other people, you know, we sort of said it's perhaps naive to expect that these obstacles, obstacles can be overcome within the next 20 years. And it may work, very well be the case that there might be a 50 year time horizon on the secure implementation of clinical genomics and individualized medicine. And we certainly hope, however, that every newborn will have the vast majority of their genome sequence and digitally available by the year 2062. Um, and I, I chose that 50 year time horizon partly because I'm 40 years old and I'm hoping that I live to age 90. <laughs> Um, and so that maybe I'll like actually see this in my lifetime. Um, and, and also because I am not entirely convinced that we will be able to get, overcome these <coughs> obstacles in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, I'm trying with many other people, hopefully uh, here as well as other places, to, to work on this. Um, so, but the talk is going to be focused a lot on uh, at least this initial part, limits of our current technology and knowledge, and going into sort of analytic validity, uh, sequencing of clinical grade genomes, bioinformatics analysis, as well as clinical validity. Um, and so to start with, um, we published this paper where um, I, Jason mainly, uh, did a lot of comparisons of multiple variant calling pipelines and including for exome and whole genome data. And the sort of showed that there was very relatively low concordance where the, the actual variant callers were, were not agreeing uh, you know, 100% of the time by any means. Uh, they were in fact, um, in, in this case, if you take, um, we'll say you, you sequence a whole genome with the Illumina platform and you sequence another whole genome with the same whole genome with the complete genomics platform with their version 2.0 pipeline right before they were bought um, by uh, the Chinese company BGI. And then you sort of put these together, uh, you sort of realize that you know the, the, the number uh, of shared things that are sort of called with single nucleotide variants is about 45 percent. There's a huge amount of things that are called by Illumina that are found by Illumina that are not found by Complete, and other things that are found by Complete that are not found by Illumina. And we have gone back in and validated with you know, high depth um, sequencing on a MySeq platform, and have shown that that uh, there are some of these that are, you know, that are true positives. I mean, they're, they're true. And, uh, and same with, and with Indels is the case, it's even less. Um, and so we, I sort of been taking a step back and I realized, you know, Stephen Lincoln trained with Eric Lander and then was at Complete Genomics. And it's interesting to me, I, I think he, well, I won't put words in his mouth, but I'm going to speculate and say that um, he left Complete Genomics and he went to this company in Vitae. Um, and this very seminal sort of paper recently was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology of the clinical evaluation of a multi-gene sequencing panel where they basically sequenced 42, they capture with an exon capture kit, um, 42 genes and they're actually doing on a MySeq platform two by 151 base pair reads with 400x average coverage. And they're also doing uh, not just standard, you know, GATK best practice, but they're also doing other algorithms of algorithms that they've developed in house to detect larger insertions, deletions, and duplications. And they do all of this in order to find, with a sensitivity and specificity greater than 99%, uh, basically all possible mutations in those 42 genes. And so that is a far, far cry. You know, in the clinical world, that's what you need. You know, you need a high depth, highly accurate. Um, panel where your false negative rate is extremely low. And that's not what Complete Genomics was offering. I mean, Complete Genomics was offering a highly precise set of calls, but that were missing you know, anywhere from 30 to 50% of the genome. So it's not, a, it's not Complete Genomics, it's 50% genomics. Um, and so that may be good enough for research where you're trying to just find or pick the low hanging fruit, but it's not good enough for um, a comprehensive, highly accurate um, whole genome. And so that's something that we've really been focused on, and I, and I, I want very much to continue working on uh, working with various providers to get a very high-grade genome. And uh, I, I don't have time, but we are working with pack bio data and other kinds of data to really get a much more accurate genome. But in terms of bioinformatics, um, you know, the, the, the problem really is that you have single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are mutations in the genome. But you also have these sort of one to a hundred bases. This is a continuum, and this is these categories are completely artificial. But you know, the idea that one to a hundred is sort of considered these insertions and deletions. Other things that are larger size, they get renamed. 
sort of arbitrarily structural variants, and then you have copy number variants, which are sort of much larger deletions and insertions or inversions and other things in the genome. So effectively, you're, you're looking to sort of characterize with all of these various different algorithms, uh, different parts of, the, of these of different kinds of mutations in the genome. Um, and so what uh, my analyst, Han Fang, and Jason Arau have really been working very hard on is trying to get a pipeline, a whole genome sequencing pipeline that is, um, you know, for, uh, that is basically um, good, uh, good at least for research grade as well as trying to increase accuracy to a clinical grade. Um, but, you know, every single one of these steps though, you're, you're, losing, you're losing accuracy. And then obviously if you're starting out with, with only whole genome sequencing to say 30x coverage, well you're already, you know, you're already losing out. So, so we're, we're, we're very much working on every single one of these um, steps. And so there's all sorts of alignment steps of the data. There's all sorts of variant calling algorithms that are used for finding out you know, various SNPs and uh, indels and copy number variants, that, which are all shown here. There's uh, genotype refinement and other things where you're basically trying to use pedigree information to sort of help you improve the, 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 the pedigrees. And you're effectively getting down to what is eventually high quality SNPs, indels, and CMDs. And in, in a perfect world, you know, we're, we're trying to get a highly accurate genome where not only is it high quality, what you'd have, but it's also comprehensive and accurate, so that that means that your false negative rate is quite low. Um, and we also then have variant filtering and, and lots of annotation downstream and other sorts of commercial entities, and eventually you're finding uh, mutations. So, you know, with Ogden syndrome, you know, you're starting out with a phenotype that's crystal clear, and you're effectively um, doing, I didn't go through that data, but very, very high level uh, coverage and depth of sequencing, and then you're basically, you know, starting, going down each of these pipelines, trying to find variants that are contributing to the disease. And that's what we were able to successfully do when you're starting out with a very rare disease with a very uh, clear phenotype. But it, it's, it's, it's much, much harder when uh, the phenotypes are not as clear, and also when a priori, um, you don't necessarily know uh, wh what you're, where you're looking. So with the case of Ogden syndrome, I'll come back to it later, it was an X-linked condition based on the, the genetic inheritance pattern over a 30-year period, um, and it was only in boys, which meant that it was, we only were looking at the X chromosome, and then we, you know, three years ago, took the wild uh, guess or hope that it would be on the exons, uh, and we were lucky in that case that we found a mutation that was in the exons, whereas uh, in some cases you're going to find things that are not in the exons. Um, uh, so more recently, um, Giuseppe, who's just started working here at the New York Genome Center, and Mike Schatz at Colston Harbor, we've uh, collaborated with them on um, where they are the lead uh, lead on this project. They've been working very much on this uh, new algorithm for accurate detection of, of, of indels. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? <laughs> Bird is being attached to the building's phone alarm system. Perfect. Please disregard any alarms that you may be here to see. Again, we're going to conduct the testing of the building's phone alarm system. Please disregard any alarms that you may be here to see. Thank you. So this is the exon, exon capture data for exon sequencing. And what is, um, this is sort of, I'm, I'm saying do not tweet this just because this has <laughs> been, uh, it's been accepted in, in this nature of methods, but it hasn't been uh, published uh, yet. Uh, and, uh, but what, what we are showing here is that Scalpel, which is the name of this new algorithm, has a 77% predictive, positive predictive value where uh, green is the ones that are validated with extensive uh, sequencing of, of PCR amplified data sets, amplicons, uh, on the MICE platform, and relative to two other um, platform, uh, two other algorithms, SOAP Indel and GATK haplotype caller version 2.4, at that time had a fairly low positive predictive value, worse than SOAP Indel. Uh, GATK has recently done a lot of improvements to get rid of these uh, sort of long, uh, spurious deletions. But even so, um, their more recent positive predictive value is about 45%. So we're still outperforming um, the, the other leading algorithms. Um, so that, uh, I encourage you to read that paper when it, it, it's published, because there's a lot more in that paper than that, for sure. Um, but that's just the highlight uh, from my perspective. Um, 
And then more recently, Han Feng in my lab has been trying to extend scalpel to comparisons of whole genome and whole exome um, sequencing data. And so um, th this segment of the talk is, is stuff that I, I would rather not be reported by a journalist just because this data set um, was provided by collaborators who uh, have not yet gotten their permission to share this publicly uh, in a tweetable or reportable sense. Uh, and so uh, we've got whole genome data with an exon capture data. Uh, you'll notice it's 100 base paired, 100 base pair reads. Uh, the, the whole genome is actually at 70x coverage, where 95% have 20 or more reads. Uh, so it's a relatively higher coverage whole genome data set. Whole exome is uh, 320x, and, and you can see this. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? We're conducting a test of the building's fire alarm system. Please disregard any alarm strokes you may hear. Take a look at this data while they're doing that. Again, we're conducting a test of the building's fire alarm system. Please disregard any alarms that you may hear or see. Thank you. So if you do the mean concordance of eight samples uh, between these two different um, pipelines, whole genome versus capture with whole exon sequencing, um, then the, you get this intersect of 52% that are exact match, not only at position, but at the, the content of the indel. If it's only position-based, it's slightly higher. And if you um, say that each of them must have a single read or more, then the concordance uh, improves somewhat. Uh, and so even with that relatively high coverage uh, uh, date, well, relatively high <coughs> coverage data, um, given what is currently being offered by these companies, um, even so, you have this sort of relatively low concordance. So whole genome sequencing deal did yield more higher quality indels relative to whole exome sequencing. So the ones that are in the intersect that were called by both platforms, um, that we call those are high confidence indels, and then. We've done this, um, this, there's this, uh, so Han has basically uh, set these threshold parameters where if you have 10 reads or more, or this chi-square statistic of less than four, uh, then that's considered as something that has relatively low error. So you can see that these high confidence indels definitely seem to have, sort of are in that area of, of, of low, of higher quality. Whereas the ones that were found uh, by whole exome sequencing, that were only found by the whole exome sequencing, seem to be in this, have a lot of these higher error rate uh, indels. And we looked into that a little bit more in detail and sort of showed that um, that a lot of these, that, that the, these higher error rate uh, whole exome specific indels seem to have an enrichment for poly A, poly T, more so than, um, than, than the uh, whole genome specific indels. And you can see that in the low, and over here with the lower error rate, it's, it's definitely a bigger, bigger chunk that's in the whole exome. And so we're currently trying to understand uh, why it is uh, that, that you have that, uh, where you're getting this sort of enrichment of poly A, poly T um, uh, uh, material in just this exon capture. Uh, and we have gone back and sort of looking at uh, comparing. Um, so in the various protocols, uh, you do, in one case, you do PCR to amplify before you put it on the, the flow cell, and in the other, you don't. And they call that PCR free. And we've sort of shown some data recently that um, that that you still you get sort of if you do a PCR free uh, that you actually get um, less of these uh, sort of errors being or less less of these high confidence things. Whereas with PCR you have more errors as shown here. Uh, and so um, we this is very consistent with some up, unpublished data that we've seen in various talks showing that PCR free um, techniques is. It helps to improve the accuracy of, of these sort of detections. And so you get, as I sort of conclude with that, with, with PCR, you yield more of these lower quality indels relative to the PCR free method. And you can sort of see that there's this high error rate based on these um, so the thresholding parameters here uh, when you are using with uh, PCR. <coughs> Whereas if you um, do the things that are called together by both, uh, by, by both, plat by both platforms, then uh, they have this much lower uh, error rate and don't have yeah, much lower error rate. Um, so, and once again, we've shown that there, once there's this enrichment with homopolymer AAT, sort of shown here as well. And uh, this is just sort of showing that somebody, a group in 2011 from Luma showed that you needed about 30 to 40 to 45 X coverage of your genome in order to get um, a, a relatively large fraction of the SNPs called, 
And so we've actually gone now and looked at what kind of coverage do you need to get 95% of the validated indels. So we've done, um, we've gone back and we've we've taken indels about out of 2,500 indels that we had found with scalpel in the whole genome. We went back and did a ton of uh, high uh, sequence, high depth sequencing with mice on about 650 of them. And using that data set, you can sort of show that you need about a 60x coverage of the genome to be able to pick out 95% of them. Uh, and Han has recently separated that out and sort of shown that with heterozygous indels, uh, you would, as, as you would uh, predict, that's where you need this higher level of coverage. Whereas if something is homozygous, where it's just you know, one thing, you then need less coverage to pick out 95% of those of those indels. But for heterozygous, you need so um, one sort of conclusion from, from that is that you're going to need um, higher coverage genomes, not just 30x genomes, but rather um, 60x genomes if you want some sort of relatively higher accuracy um, clinical, uh, higher accuracy genome. Um, and so moving on into the last sort of large section of the talk is, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, th this is going to take a team approach. This is not something that I can solve on my own. This is why I'm giving this talk here and talking about, I mean, these are things that the entire communities are, are working on, and these things will uh, improve over time. And I personally think that these are things that will be solved uh, in the next uh, few years. This is the, the bigger issue, which is clinical validity. Um, and so, you know, with the family, as I said, with Ogden syndrome, uh, the difference really is that the phenotype is incredibly clear. And so the unaffected people, including unaffected uncle and unaffected brother, were like, you know, you did not have to be a clinician to see that, you know, this is a 30-year-old you know, man who's totally never had any problems whatsoever, and his brother, two brothers, have this very severe condition, and they've both died by the age of two. Um, and the same goes here. So when the phenotype is obvious, and, and then you put that into the, that whole pipeline, it makes things just so much easier uh, downstream. Whereas if you, as I've done, get trained in psychiatry and spent five years trying to sort of really come to terms with um, sort of these more complicated sort of mental illnesses like obsessive compulsive disorder or Tourette syndrome or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, even when you go to a state like Utah, and you go to a family where everyone in the family is Caucasian, including everyone that's married into the family is Caucasian. Everyone is Mormon, uh, and they all live in basically the same like town. So their environment is like all basically the same. And you've got basically 74 or so people uh, over this large family. Even then, and, you, and then you sit there and do extensive clinical interviews, as I've done, and lots of phenotyping, you sort of, you know, these, these sort of artificial categorical sort of names, you know, tick disorder, OCD, ADHD, they, they, they overlap in some of the individuals, they, but they don't, you know, they're shared, you know, two, and 21 of them have features of both, two have ADHD, but 14 have all three, and then some, including uh, people that married into the family are, seem to be devoid of, of any of these kinds of mental illnesses. But to sort of really just drive home the complexity of the problem, you know, if you really look at it, you know, this, this lady, uh, this is branch one of 10. So this, this is actually, there are 10 other, there are nine other siblings of this person. So this spreads out into 10 other, 10 siblings. Um, and this is a woman who married into the family who is perfectly normal in terms of no mental illness whatsoever that we could discern. Um, and then, you know, this person has very severe Tourette syndrome and also mild OCD, and they marry and have, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six children, you know, three, four or five, five of whom have uh, basically levels of Tourette syndrome, levels of obsessive compulsive disorder, and levels of ADHD. Um, but it's a continuum. It's not something categorical. It's not something where you or I or any other um, person that I can find, um, even somebody who spent five years in psychiatry training, can sit there and say definitively that, you know, that, that this person here, this woman, has, you know, she seems to have a low score on this, this Young Global Tick Severity Scale. She's got a moderate score in OCD. 
So she's, you know, I cannot say that she's unaffected. Um, and then there, this woman married into the family and she has some mild OCD. And on some level there's also a sort of uh, a sort of mating in the sense that sometimes people um, find that likes attract like. And so if you have Tourette syndrome, you start going to the Tourette Syndrome Association uh, group and that's where you meet your spouse. And so that you start to have lots of other um, issues uh, coming in there as well. So, so this, is the this is really the, the complexity of, uh, that we're facing. Um, so we really don't know the expression of pretty much all mutations in humans as we have not systematically sequenced or karyotyped any genetic alteration in thousands and millions of randomly selected people. I mean, I think that the closest is probably Down syndrome, um, but you know, we, we have not done a trisomy 21 screen on a million randomly selected people, um, and nor have we done uh, in-depth phenotyping on um, a million people uh, and we certainly have not taken a million people with Down with trisomy 21 or mosaic trisomy 21 or other sorts of uh, uh, modifiers. Um, and so we don't really have no idea, frankly, what the true expression of Down syndrome is, let alone any other uh, uh, genetic disease. And so really, um, you know, in the year 2014, uh, we are really facing this massive uh, problem with uh, not really being able to truly understand um, the, the phenotype, some of the phenotypes that we're dealing with, and we're sort of in this, um, so human beings have this very, all the going back to Linnaeus, have this very, uh, this, this, this absolute desire to categorize, like humans just love to like categorize, even like Mendel, like he, you know, loved to like say that his pee was green or yellow, or it was wrinkled or round, uh, wrinkled or round. But if you actually go back to the, the actual papers and you go back to Weldon's work, you actually go back and look at the P's, the P's are um, a continuum. Uh, and, it's, and if you outbreed, and those are in purebred um, lines, if you even do a single outcross of Mendel's plants, you start to get into all these modifiers, and so all of it just automatically uh, breaks down. So the, the word Mendelian is incredibly artificial because every disease is a continuum. Um, so that's why, um, we sort of published in this recent manuscript that we spent um, a lot of time thinking about and writing, that, you know, this idea of a, which is, this is intuitively obvious to, if you explain it to like a high school student. Um, it's not, it's just, it's just that for some reason, um, once you, once some human beings go through training, um, <laughs> you know, then as they go along in life, they sort of somehow close off their capability to, understand what a high school student can understand, which is that that of course you have this phenotypic spectrum, which is on this axis, and I sort of flattened it out, but typically it's a bell curve, right? But but that bell curve um, is is modulated by time as well as the environmental insults. And so of, of course every human being is totally unique. Every human being has trillions of cells in their body. Every human being has um, all sorts of somatic mutations going on in every cell of the body. And so, of course, um, there's this massive uh, complexity uh, that we are just beginning to scratch the surface of. And so we, we sort of articulated that in this, I'm a real fan of preprint servers and trying to sort of break down um, um, sort of the, you know, just, just sort of trying to get things out there and trying to sort of share knowledge more quickly. And so, you know, we sort of encapsulate that in this, uh, this article on the bioarchive that, you know, that, that basically that, there are, that no two human beings are the same and that there's only seven billion of us, there's absolutely no way that any two people are the same, including monozygotic twins, because monozygotic twins have all sorts of somatic mutations, they have all sorts of, of, of things going on with their environment, so really no two people are, are, are even remotely um, alike. And, and even in the Ogden syndrome case, you know, where you have five different boys in one family, like the variability of their disease was incredibly different. Like some, one of them died after a month with no medical intervention. The other one, uh, another one lasted two years because he'd been in the ICU like a dozen times. Um, and so of course with environmental interventions you can modulate um, disease expression. Um, but the reason we were successful at least at, at identifying a high effect size mutation was because the phenotype was crystal clear. That's what I'm getting at, and so so um, we have to get at how do we uh, characterize phenotype in a very highly accurate way. 
in order to start to understand things that are more complicated, such as schizophrenia or Tourette syndrome. So right now, in the year 2014, we're sort of in this, uh, this sort of mindset, you know, where many researchers are sort of um, picking the low-hanging fruit. You know, they'll sequence a lot of exomes, and you know, out of every 100 exomes, they'll get a couple of hits and a couple of genes that sort of make sense when they do this like Go network analysis, even though anyone you talk to who knows anything about machine learning says that Go, the Go network has got all kinds of issues with it. And so then they publish a paper saying, okay, I found the, the gene for, um, they usually say, you know, in, uh, you can read every, a lot of articles will say, we the gene X causes phenotype Y. And then throughout the paper, it's categorical thinking where they say, you know, we, we solved this disease. This disease is now solved because we found a mutation in this gene, end of story. And so, so that is kind of where we are now. And, and of course, the problem is that these people are like this blind guy who are literally just looking for their keys where the light is, despite the fact that, they, that they're drunk and they've lost their keys down the block in the darkness. Um, and so and another way of sort of saying that is that right now we're sort of just it's got this massive false negative problem where we're just, we're not, you know, there's so much we just don't know, obviously. Um, and, you know, other people have sort of started to realize this. People have published papers where they've said, oh, you know, all these papers that have been published sort of saying that this mutation causes that phenotype where the person had, there's nothing in the paper about modifiers or phenotypic expressivity differences. And, you know, it turns out we're finding these mutations now in all sorts of controls, you know, people that have come in and been sequenced as controls for other studies. And so they, this paper sort of uh, goes back and sort of says, like, a lot of these prior studies are, are obviously overly simplistic. Um, you know, I published a paper also sort of saying that we need to increase standards uh, in terms of sample collection and handling and how do we um, get higher accurate genomes. We, we had this. Uh, this paper was recently published by other group and um, I, one thing that I, that I enjoyed in this paper was they at least are in trying to increase the standards and saying that you need to find the mutation in at least two or more unrelated families. Uh, there is a lot of categorical thinking and, and causality kind of things in this paper that I don't agree with, but I do at least agree with the, the, the notion of, um, of, of not allowing people to just publish, you know, we found the mutation in a single individual, and therefore we think it causes this disease. I mean, the, and there are lots of, I mean, even my own Ogden syndrome, I've had to, like, deal with papers that have been published in the last three years where people have found a mutation in the same gene and have sort of said, this mutation causes this other disease, and now I've got to like try to deal with that, which is yeah. So so it's so complex that the only solid way forward is with a networking of science model, i.e. online databases with genotype and phenotype logically track for thousands of volunteer families. Um, and that's why I have that is the only reason really that I have been so actively engaged with Ancestry.com, patients like me, and 23andMe is that I feel like if you're going to, you have to educate the populace by going through social media channels, using the internet. You, know, you have to be uh, able to um, go online and get your genetic data. You have to be able to enter your phenotype data. Like if I, and, and there are also people, there, there's an interesting company that's based out of California that has developed the ability to uh, basically stick your finger in a box and then it pinpricks your finger and you get a tiny little spot of blood and then they send that off and get all of your lab panels. And so, you know, last week I wanted to go to the doctor to just get my lab annual physical uh, and they wanted me to come in a week before fasting, like across town, and they wanted me to like give them blood. And I ended up canceling the appointment. I'm like a doctor and so I haven't had a physical or blood work in a few years because I just can't be bothered with that. Whereas I knew, I know if I could just walk into my local Walgreens, stick my finger in a machine, or get a pen prick, and I get all my blood analyzed and upload it automatically. Like, if, and I, I, I mean, I got a Fitbit, right? So I have the ability to like say, okay, I have walked, you know, eight thousand steps so far today. And like, this is now like being loaded, you know, onto automatically, uh, remotely onto my dashboard. Like, I would love to be able to do that with my genotype data, with all of my lab results. And and this is happening. And and these companies are at least pushing in that direction. Um, so as I said, there are tons of barriers that, um, uh, you know, on, 
it depends on the day in terms of my mood. You know, some days I wake up and think that this can be somehow accomplished in the next 20 years. Other days I say I think 50 years. Um, but you know, these are things that we as a society and we as people at the New York Genome Center and at other places need to to work on. And as I said, these are not the sorts of problems that can be um, addressed in siloed academic medical centers. They have to. You have to, this is just so complex that we need to be doing this in this networking of science model. Um, and, 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 and of course you run afoul of these sort of philosophical issues, is that you know, some people really, really value privacy much, much more than autonomy. And believe it or not, um, there are many, many people, lawyers and others included, who love bureaucracy. Um, they just love it, um, and they love to create lots and lots of bureaucracy, and so you, you have to sort of um, deal with that. Like, you know, so you're, you're getting into you know, human mentality, and so ha in order to push forward, you have to sort of uh, compete, uh, compete or you know, uh, work with uh, <laughs> these, uh, these other entities. And so clearly I'm in the libertarian class, um, but you know, we, there was this presidential commission that put out this report on a whole genome sequencing, and I worked uh, behind the scenes very hard to try to influence their recommendations. Uh, they highlighted our study on Ogden syndrome, and where I was sort of saying that we needed to be able to return the data, we needed to be doing the sequencing in a clinical grade fashion, um, we need to be giving this data back to people, but we need to be doing the sequencing itself in a clinically certified laboratory so that at least we have some kind of minimum standard in place. And when I was trying to do this two years ago, the idea was I, I really did not want the FDA to step into this. Like I did not want the FDA to just come in and say, oh, you know, you 23 me people, you know, you're not doing you know, good science and we're gonna shut you down. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, despite them putting out this report, you know, uh, not everyone reads, uh, nor do they read this report. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, in the report, they said, the presidential commission said that you know, we should be moving toward clinical grade whole genome sequencing. We should be moving to a world where everything is done in CLIA approved labs. And that you know, obviously there's going to be um, uh, constant innovation, but we should at least be having, implementing this minimum standard that's compliant in the United States with this CLIA federal minimum standards. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, and then I published this policy piece sort of saying that we need to have systematic sample collection and handling, we need to have systematic sequencing and analytics, and systematic interpretation. And you know, I, it, proof of principle was that I, you know, this company, Illumina, has a CLIA certified lab uh, where everything has been validated and, and is, is CLIA certified and consistent with a laboratory developed test. And um, I was the first person um, that I know of in the world to order from Illumina, a CLIA certified genome on a patient, uh, and then give them back directly their hard drive with their entire uh, genomic data on it. Um, and we published this paper sort of saying that we had sequenced this person who, um, by the way, I, I'm a big advocate of brain machine, uh, a whole different talk, but brain machine interfaces is really exciting. I've been working for the last decade on deep brain stimulation in the treatment of, of psychiatric illness. And so, you know, Parkinson's disease is now treated effectively with deep brain stimulation. We sort of showed here that you could treat OCD with neurosurgical implantation of electrodes into the nucleus incumbents of this individual. Um, and this follows on a lot of other people's work. But the sort of novel thing um, was that we, we, had, we used a lot of these platforms and we did a lot of interpretation, we found a lot of different variants that sort of predisposed to, to mental illness, uh, including in this Nature Genetics uh, GWAS paper on schizophrenia, um, they had identified many different loci that seemed to have marginally, um, marginal effects on increasing susceptibility to mental illness, and we showed that our individual that we had sequenced was homozygous for several of these exact um, same SNFs, heterozygous for others, and also heterozygous for these as well, and homozygous. And so, so clearly, um, something as complex as mental illness, severe mental illness, which this person had, um, it's not going to be a single gene, as I've been trying to articulate this entire uh, meeting. It's more going to be multiple genes, multiple mutations interacting with environment, and you can try to um, 
collate millions of data sets in order to try to predict at some future point um, those people that at birth may be, have a slightly increased uh, probability of developing a mental illness. And I don't know if the bell curves will um, separate. You know, we don't know that. We don't know if the bell curves will separate enough uh, to be able to get some sort of truly predictive uh, capability. But we, don't, we can't know that until we do the experiment which is why I'm advocating that we, that we do this in a clinical grades uh, fashion. Um, we did find, just in case you're um, a naysayer, um, uh, we did find... May I hear attention, please? May I hear attention, please? We are conducting a test of the building's fire alarm system. Please disregard any alarms that you may hear or see. Again, we are conducting a test of the building's fire alarm system. Please disregard any alarms that you may hear or see. Thank you. I'll, I'll finish up really quickly here. Is that, so, uh, Prozac, um, so uh, Prozac, we found that he had a pharmacogenetic variant that made him not able to process the Prozac. And I would have liked to have known that before I spent two years trying to treat this individual uh, with Prozac. Um, and so really, you know, clinical validity, we, we need to have a place like New York Genome Center collaborating with people like this uh, in industry, as well as other partnerships that are starting to sequence lots of different people and try to overcome these many different obstacles. And so just the last slide is just, you know, genetic background obviously matters, modifiers matter in a massive way. We need to improve the accuracy of whole genomes, which I and others are doing. Uh, we need to share broadly, we need to basically move towards sequencing highly accurate genomes in large pedigrees, building super family structures, and having online phenotyping and longitudinal data as well as you know, being able to upload your Fitbit analysis, as well as your lab data that you get from your at, at your Walgreens. So, so these are all things that I think are coalescing. I just don't know if it's going to be 15 years or 50 years, and that's sort of collectively up to us as a society to try to um, sort of move the needle or move the bar, or however you want to say it, uh, faster. So, thank you very much. massively sort of shotgun sequencing where you're getting all sorts of reads from the genome 
and you're trying to align them back to something, and it's just harder to align them and harder to basically make uh, calls of indels when you have you know, more than just a single change. Um, and your third question, oh, in terms of the algorithm. So it's a microassembly algorithm, uh, and I am going to defer that question to Giuseppe and Mike Schatz, because I, I just feel like I would handle that. Okay. So I'm not gonna go there. Okay, and then the second question I have is on uh, kind of the other end of the spectrum of, of what you talked about, and this really gets to, I think, your really distinctive view in our field. So as, as a clinician, you have so much deeper understanding of, of how people vary in shape and in behavior than many of us do, especially many, many genomicists. We think in terms of abstract patterns of DNA sequence variation, and we see these long names of sim the symptoms in a syndrome, and they often mean very little to us because we haven't had the experience working with patients. And I wonder if you could talk about that, the importance of that clinical expertise in, in this conversation that we have between clinicians, genomicists, patients, and other stakeholders, and also that same knowledge that's in the families of people, of, of someone with a sick child experiencing that phenotypic arc over, over the, the child's first few years of life, getting to know really well that phenotypic variation day to day in ways that can really inform the interpretation of, of the big genome data. Right. So, yeah, so, I mean, you spend five years, uh, as I did at Columbia and then NYU and Bellevue, where you're actively seeing lots and lots of people. You sort of get a deep understanding of families and various phenotypes. Uh, and, you know, that's part of the whole being a clinician. But the problem is, is that in our current society, you know, clinicians are sort of isolated individuals that are sort of being paid to sort of treat a large mass of people, but really, frankly, it's like a you know, it's like a river of humanity, and you have like a few like sticks, which are physicians and various providers, sort of trying to like help everyone. And of course, it's impossible. I mean, so uh, the fact is that each clinician is uh, may have more knowledge, but the real people that have the knowledge are the families. So like the mother and the father who have, and, and I, I know this because they've all talked. You know, someone comes to me with a child with severe autism, and we spend months going over the, the phenotype and trying to try medications. Like, by far and away, like, the mother and the father know way, way more about the disease and their child than anyone else in the planet. Um, How do you get, is it like being a police sketch artist to get that information out of their heads and into something that you can make use of to, to understand it? Possibly. Well, I, I, I Yes, uh, that is what some clinicians do, but unfortunately, other forces in our society have made it so that the clinician has 15 minutes to do that. And so, that, unfortunately, that means that that information is being lost. And so right now in America, the electronic medicals do not reflect that richness and texture, which is why I'm saying you need uh, 23andMe and Ancestry.com. You need these interfaces or like you know the Rare Genomics Institute that Jimmy Lin has started. Like you need some way uh, to engage with families as 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 well as Facebook does. Like everybody can go on Facebook, like pretty much everyone, and they upload so much stuff, amazing amounts of stuff. So if you could have like a a, a way to encourage families with kids with severe mental illness or severe developmental delay, and so to be able to go on and upload as much information as they can you'll get a much more rich uh, description of the phenotype than you'll ever get from clinicians or electronic medical records, at least on the scale that I'm talking. And you start to put families together where they can find each other, like two families that had very similar syndrome or symptoms in the case yeah. of autism. Yeah, and it's happening organically. There's a velocardiofacial syndrome website, there's a 22, there's a 16P website, but you know, that we haven't yet gotten like Facebook people behind it or Google people behind it. Like we, we need to get those kind of people behind this and sort of get the, the outreach to, to really make this launch. I mean, patients like me is sort of kind of getting there, but it just hasn't quite got the sort of backing of, of, of people. Part, and I, I, there are reasons for that, which I could sort of talk to people privately about. Just following up on the same uh, theme. So for Facebook, uh, with some embarrassment, people were happy to show a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, but if you're a member of, uh, let's say, some patient support group, uh, any kind of disease that has a stigma from you, you know, you don't have leprosy, but we do have psychiatric illness and, and uh, 
cancer, still is a disease with stigma and stuff like that. Uh, it, from the people you've spoken to and the thinking you've done yourself, how do you see it? Sort of a, a hierarchy of privateness that you meet a person personally, you're willing to share the details of your family member's illness with that family, but not a wider group, or yeah. it's partially anonymized, and then you can do more? Because you want to get all this very specific knowledge, but on the other hand, uh, I can really see privacy concerns uh, uh, going directly against it. Yeah, no, I agree. That's why you need to get the people um, who are very familiar with this sort of thing, um, uh, like uh, Facebook and, and other places, to try to set up, you know, privacy settings and things like that. I mean, I'm a member of Facebook. I don't use it that often, but I started using it a lot more recently because I've been doing, as I said, deep brain stimulation for OCD, and there was a, a, a woman who had a son who. Um, got implanted and then she decided to start a DBS for OCD uh, social group on Facebook. So I joined that group and it originally was public and then they we collectively decided to make it private recently. And you know, I recently, it was interesting, we had a patient, somebody come in for a consultation at NYU where I'm working as well. And you know, this person, uh, you know, spent three hours with us. Um, you know, gave us a lot of information about their particular situation. But then I go on to Facebook and like, there's like, you know, five years of postings from this person sort of giving just this incredibly rich and detailed description of their syndromes and all the stuff they were doing. And, and I realized that there's just no way that I'm ever going to get that. Um, so we need to, how do we get that? So, and so you, you also sort of, you know, out of the 315 million people in America at least, it, sure, there are people that are not going to want to participate, but there are going to be others like that who are going to, you know, if it's there and, and easily usable, um, then they will use it. So just to follow up on that, um, I, I think it's, it's really terrific, very much needed, and, and kudos for taking that approach. But just a word of caution, as you talk about clinical validity, of course, there's you know obvious biases in that in, in that neck model as well. So, so for example, that subset of patients who um, or potential patients who uh, who agree to, to come out in the open, even with variable degrees of um, privacy protected, are going to be biased, right? I mean, I, right off the bat, you can hypothesize their sort of paranoia score is going to be lower. But, but not, not that you shouldn't do it, I guess. There's some way to control for that inevitable bias. The, yeah. the most paranoid um, can't even look at themselves in the mirror without assuming right. that everybody's screaming at them what, how crazy they are. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, I, I think it's very valuable. I, I also wonder, though, um, uh, going back to your initial concern um, about whether this will ever get out in the open, I, I wonder if we really wanted to. I, I remember the first time I ever saw Seymour Kennedy, the first guy to show that monozygotic and dizygotic twins have um, different levels of accordance and schizophrenia risk in their offspring. Um, and and uh, it, there was a group, uh, this was the science of the public lecture at Harvard, there was a group of schizophrenics anonymous scattered throughout. And to a, to a T, every one of them was opposed to the notion that anything they went through in life was genetic. And it made me wonder, you know, for many groups, they're sort of relieved that there's an explanation. But for them, uh, it almost seemed like their die had been cast, that, that this was a, and, and it made me wonder, is it some sort of, imagine if somebody could tell you the genetics of your pulmonary capacity before you run the New York Marathon. Is that a good thing? In other words, it, 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 it sort of defies us to, to sort of balance who they are, how they see themselves, and make sure, that even as we give them their potentialities, that we don't um, limit their uh, potentialities. And, and so, so how you deal with this is going to, I think it's going to be one of the barriers. I'm with you. I would love to see that as a clinician, that we all have this information. But that's always going to be the hazard. As we look at them, they're looking back at us. You know, they're, they're peering and gazing. And, and then they're looking back into themselves from what they learned about, uh, about themselves from our interaction. So you're right, it's complex, but there's also, there is a moral and ethical um, uh, issue which is going to uh, be greater than just um, us sort of convincing them. We really have to solve the problem of how we make sure people understand it. And you did it. You explained it to us. It's a potentiality. It's a probabil probability. It's not a, a, a fate. Uh, but most people uh, also have a very difficult time understanding the probability. They, right. they say, am I schizophrenic or not? Am I going to get it or not? Right. But how much time you spend with them? 
So you have, to, so you have to educate people, but you know, they, to me, it's about sort of focusing on these sort of um, early onset devastating illnesses where mother and father are really looking for answers. Um, you know, things like schizophrenia or severe mental illness that starts at age, you know, 20 or 15. Uh, those are things that I think the, the time horizon is even farther out, um, frankly. Uh, I, um, but you know, that being said, there are, you know, I, there, are, there, there are trials that have been published as well as my own experience working with youth that, so, you know, I've had um, several instances now where somebody has come to me, you know, whose mother was horribly mentally ill with horrible schizophrenia, and left the family, and, you know, the boy was brought up by the father, the child is brought to me at age uh, 13, by the father, he says, you know, my son is acting a little strangely, he's a little off, he's a little socially awkward, he's a little, little paranoid, and you know, can you help? Uh, and so I spend like two years working with this, this person and, you know, educating and intervening and basically saying, you know, that you may be predisposed, I don't know, but you may be predisposed and like, you know, educating them at age 13 that, this is what psychosis is, and this is what, if you're hearing a voice telling you to go kill your, uh, your mother or father, that's actually outside of the bell curve of typical, normal sort of stuff, and you know, here are the medications that you might consider, you know, so doing all this education, and now five years later, this person is a, you know, relatively successful college student who I think uh, could have gone the other way, you know, and, uh, it's not like his destiny was predetermined. His destiny was modulated by um, very a lot of interventions that we set in motion. And so all I'm saying is that at some point in maybe 50 to 100 years, it's possible, but maybe not, that at birth you'll be able to say you have this slightly probabilistic increased risk of, of developing a uh, severe mental illness and we have this, and whereas you don't have a risk of developing type 1 diabetes. Um, so we're not going to, you know, put so much effort into you know, educating you about diabetes because we don't think you're going to develop type 1 diabetes based on your genomics. But we are going to put more effort into educating you about a mental illness. And so we're going to base, and we're going to do that online. We're not going to have you come in and see a physician to do that. We're going to do it through this internet. Uh, through, through, you know, getting you, um, getting you with peers that have similar genomic predispositions. That's the idea. But that is, you know, 100 years maybe away, as far as I can tell. Um, so I have a question. Um, it's fine. It's it is. Um, so I have a question about privacy, and I'm especially excited to hear your thoughts, since you, it sounds like you've done some policy work, you've, you know, uh, you know talked to the FDA. But how restrictive do you think the unsettled privacy issues are in terms of scientists being able to get their work done? Meaning, do you think that if legislation was a little more forward thinking and if there were better privacy protections or, you know, either way, like protections or liberal thinking about privacy, do you think that that would open some floodgates for you and suddenly people would be banging down your doors <coughs> to get you know, to give you their genetic data. I mean, I'm specifically thinking of 23 in Maine. I'm guilty of owning the box, and I'm kind of paranoid to send the kid back. Like, <laughs> I don't really know what's going to happen to that data. Do you think that the floodgates might open once, from a policy standpoint, some of that shakes itself out? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> I wish I did. Uh, the uh, issue, though, is. Um, you know, obviously, if, if when somebody at the FDA says in a very categorical way that you know every mutation or every medical interpretation that you give back must have you know, this incredible level of evidence backing it up, and they basically close down the entire um, that entire um, service, it, it that certainly does put a stop to um, collection of DNA, and it may not occur through 23andMe at this point. It, right now, Ancestry.com is sort of doing this instead. They've got 500,000 people where they've basically said, you know, for those of you, we're not going to give you medical interpretation, but we are at least um, collecting your DNA so that we can uh, connect you to other other people that you're related to. Um, and you can imagine that that might be one way to build up that sort of superstructure. Um, you know, I think that 
that's also the reason I drew those sort of things is that there are libertarians and there are not libertarians. There are people that are you know not going to participate. Um, I think that the current very restrictive um, uh, view is what's dominant in our society. And I think that in the, the medical profession and the medical genetics academy, um, there's this very extraordinarily conservative, extraordinarily paternalistic uh, way of thinking that basically says um, we are not going to um, tolerate uh, any uh, false positives or false names. I mean, you know, the people that are just expecting the bar to be um, extremely high, and I am working toward trying to make genomics uh, a better, higher accuracy, but uh, to, to sort of say that um, we're going to wait 20 years uh, until we have a whole genome, it's already been 10 years and we don't have a, a whole genome, right? We don't have a, a perfectly assembled whole genome. There are regions of the genome that we still don't know, first off. And in, even the part that we do know, the 90 or so percent, uh, we don't have a perfect genome. That. So are we going to wait, have to wait 20 years to, to get to that before we're allowed to sort of do um, sort of massive uh, you know, whole genome sequencing of the entire population? You know, that, that's, and, and you know, I, I tried to sort of strike a balance uh, where I say it needs to be done in a Clio lab, it needs to be done with some sort of minimum standards, but it does not need to be regulated as though it's a medical test. But unfortunately, you know, people at the FDA and various lawyers have publicly and written, I was reading a policy piece on my way down here, where they said every sequencer is going to, needs to be a FDA approved type three medical device, which is the highest stringency. And if you actually like, talk to these people at the FDA, they, don't, they actually have no idea what that means in terms of how the hell you know, are you going to get a whole genome sequence on, on a type three medical device and in return to people. So at the moment, the, the, the policy makers are in that very conservative, very restrictive uh, mindset. And, and so people are moving offshore. 23andMe is thinking about moving offshore. You know, there are companies that are uh, in, in, in other countries that are starting to sequence their population. Uh, and the United States is basically losing out on trying to be at the forefront of that. How many people here are just curious? I was just going to ask one quick question. How many people here would actually donate their, their data to an effort like this if it were anonymized? And how about, uh, if, what about your phenotype data in association with that data? So if, if, if not a majority, it looks like there's a, a pretty decent plurality. But there's a massive ascertainment bias. <laughs> 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 you know, yeah, there's a slick. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it, 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 you know, seven billion people in the world. I mean, there's a big data conference right now going on at Stanford, and I was watching the live feed today, and there were 200 other viewers, right? So seven billion people, they had 200 people watching this conference on, you know, genomic medicine. So I, I have to say that we are in a massive little bubble, yeah. and to those, uh, you know, to, to go, we are at, like at the stage when, like. Uh, um, you know, the, uh, when Steve Jobs and, and others were like in their garage and they like made the first few computers and they're like, people, this is like an incredible <laughs> thing, really, it really is beautiful, like please use our computers. And like for like 15 years, like, mm. and it's only now, 30 years or so, where like, you know, I can, like, this is like the most amazing device that I've ever, like, it's like uh, absolutely brilliant, right? And so like, you know, so how do we get to that world with, with genomic medicine. That actually dovetails perfectly to my question, which was um, I've been to some panels earlier this week that were talking about um, existing diagnostic testing. Uh, and there was someone in the audience who was very concerned that these tests were not 100% accurate. Um, and then we had to, there was kind of the education aspect of sensitivity and specificity and the false positives and just the education around that. Right. And, so I guess my question is more around um, what lessons can be learned from the semi-successful deployment of genetic tests to identify disease now in the context of, um, as things are progressing, more into the sequencing space. So if you're looking at specific diseases that have treatments, um, genetic diseases, that, um, like Gaucher's disease and things like that, what can we learn from the diagnostic process and then translate that to work? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the Supreme Court decision sort of said you can, you know, basically ruled against 
saw two or so of the patents from Myriad, um, and that has allowed companies like Invite to sort of roll out a multiple gene panel that includes these sort of well-known breast cancer genes. Um, they are being sued, though, by the way, by Myriad, and Myriad is not releasing their own proprietary database of numerous mutations. So, you know, Myriad is the sort of, um, you know, it's the sort of, uh, well, so Myriad is, is, is over there, and then, you know, at least there are people that are trying to do this targeted panel and trying to sequence the, the entire population um, and see about finding people that have these high effect size mutations that predispose to breast cancer, but those will obviously miss the modifiers. So there are going to be lots of people that are going to get a true positive BRCA1 mutation that is in Ashkenazi Jews highly uh, expressive. You know, and so in the Ashkenazi Jewish background, there, you know, like 90% of these uh, people go on to get breast cancer. But we don't know if you're Egyptian uh, and you have that mutation, what is the uh, expressivity of that mutation in that person? And so we, we run the risk of this sort of categorical thinking, which I'm concerned about, is that we'll roll out BRCA1 testing to the entire population, and we'll get a lot of, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll prevent a lot of cancer, but we'll also you know, create a lot of maybe unnecessary testing, and so, and so that's a balance that we have to we have to take, right? Uh, and there are and then there are the, there's the profit motive. You know, the problem is is that the entire medical genetics and diagnostic industry is about targeted panels. Like Myriad is rich because they had flogged uh, America for five thousand dollars a pop for BRCA1 testing. You know, and Evite is nice is nice too, but on some level they have to make money, and so they're selling a 44 gene panel. You know, the, no, you don't see anybody stepping in and saying we're going to sequence the, you know, we have, we have, we have not seen the president say, all right, it's going to cost $4 billion to sequence all the newborns right now using existing technology, and we are going to sort of redistribute money from something else to sequence every newborn with you know, 60x coverage on the Illumina platform. Like that's what we kind of it's, and we have instead that that money is going toward like brainy initiatives and other things, but we're not we don't have that kind of leadership. At all. We're not. I mean, but that's two different things. One is you're saying, but I mean, that's you're saying one is they're just doing restrictive amounts of testing, which I agree. They're not taking that step into a whole genome sequencing. Yeah. As a prospectively sequencing everyone without having a sense of what the... I mean, you're, you're also trying to get people to annotate phenotype. I understand that, but I, I'm, not, I'm not following the logic here. So the, the logic is that um, if you do a targeted gene panel in our current profit motive driven society uh, where you have ascertainment bias and you're having mostly people getting referred in uh, with known breast cancer sort of predisposition in the family, you get this massive ascertainment bias where you say every you find all these mutations and you say and you have simplistic thinking where people say this mutation equals that disease. Whereas if you could figure out a way to convince, you know, sequence the entire population with that targeted panel, I think you would find that, there, that there's massive variability in expression. Um, and if you did it with whole genome, you would find it even more. Um, and you know, to me, uh, it's like how do you get from point A to the point B of you know, to, you know you, we can do these like Brownian motion, like little tiny steps, but what we need is everyone, at least in America, sequenced so that you can really analyze the data uh, collectively together. Like that, you know, like Joel Dudley gave a talk from Mount Sinai today where he, at least with, with data points in diabetes, was able to sort of, it seemed, be able to classify people from, with typically type 2 diabetes, it sort of separated out into many other sort of classes. So that sort of bigger data approach um, allows you to get there. That's still within a disease subset, though. That's not everyone all the time without phenotype, without epigenetics. Right, yeah, no, I agree with you. It's an, it's an enormous problem. It's not something that, I, that one person collectively can solve, right? But I think if you, you know, I think that the fact is that 30 years ago, if you had said to somebody in, in an audience such as this, there's this thing called the internet, and in the year 2014, there's going to be billions of people on something called Facebook, and everyone's going to be like having these like smartphones in their pocket, and you could like upload Fitbit data. Like I think 30 years ago, 
many, many people would have, because each human being sort of says, like, that's not possible, but like, there's nobody on the planet that can actually understand how this pen was entirely made, right? Like, this pen is the collective effort of millions and millions of people. Like, this, like, literally nobody in the world knows all the information that goes into how you make the ink, how you make the plastic, how you make the, like, this thing, you know, like, there's, there's absolutely no one in the entire world. And that's what makes humans so amazing, is that we collectively pull our individual talents so that we can make a pen, or we can make an Apple computer, right? So the, the fact is that each person says, this is absolutely impossible, we're never gonna be able to do that. But then you think about it, and you realize, yeah, maybe in 50 years, hopefully in 20, we will get to that world that I'm trying to describe. But if you don't articulate that vision, you know, if, you, if you're not like somebody like Steve Jobs, I'm not saying I am, but I'm, I'm just saying that there are people in the world that sort of come up with sort of visions and they try to like implement them and sometimes they're successful. That's what I'm trying to articulate here. Yeah, that's a one. One last question? Yes. Cool. Uh, first a disclaimer. Uh, my only credential is that I spit in the box. Okay. Spit in a 23 box? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> um, um, following another thread, talking about the, um, the barriers uh, because humans love to categorize. Uh -huh. There is another one that, that comes to mind, and that is that uh, I just recently saw a study on uh, as scientific fact as, as, it, as it is currently known is presented in several different ways. Uh, the reluctance of most people to accept it is very high. Uh, I, I think I recently posted something like, uh, for those people uh, out there who are raw milk advocates or who refuse to have their children vaccinated, Edward Jenner and Louis Pasteur never existed. So um, other than that, I'm an optimist, but I understand about the long, the long view and how difficult it, how difficult it yeah. is. To, uh, I, that's why I'm saying a 50 year horizon. Because there's, I mean, I, I, if you read the book chapter that I posted on BioArchive, I sort of, I articulated the arguments that are there throughout this talk um, and at the end, the conclusion, the first, the quote is from um, Planck, who said that, you know, you, you, you can never convince your opponents. You can only wait for them to die and convince the younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, like, the, I am not, um, you know, that's the point. And so that's why I have, you know, in my lab, high school students, undergrads, like, you know, I catch these people, um, you know, when they're young, and, and, and it's also, it's, you know, and frankly, like, I don't know that I'll be alive in 50 years, right? I'm 40 years old, I, you know, who knows? I may, I may, yeah, if I, I got, I, I, my genome has been sequenced, but I have not yet, you know, decided that it's worth really putting a lot of effort into analyzing it. I mean, even though my father and grandfather had prostate cancer, you know, it's possible that I have a high effect size mutation in my genome that, will predispose me to prostate cancer, and maybe it's I need to called the Y chromosome. Well, that too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but anyway, so, so just trying to move the bar toward that world. So thank you so much for everyone for coming. <laughs> so, please take your magic pens and go off the <laughs> And it's a great call to come gather and put our minds together over to Nice to meet you. Mary. I'll see you I'll probably be at the next one. Yep. I like these talks. Absolutely. And I'm going to check out the... Check out rockefeller.edu and then the calendar. Or you can just show up Friday, any Friday at 3.25 p.m. Right. You know, here's some mobile lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's so sad to hear him say, like, 200 people are walked in on this conference room. I don't understand why in a world where people crave information, they only crave it in certain ways. So they actually just want to log in and watch a genius who studied something for 10 years ago. They just want to see a blur of so they can say they know it's coming.
a lot going on in New York. There's a lot of competition. It's just amazing that that kind of people like sort of go find, find. It's a lot of people like the stamp job. That's many things to do here. Would you rather do go for a walk in the park or see it? <laughs> this is yeah. people's preference. <laughs> Uh, I took a gamble. Are you going to go? No. Yeah. Alright. Nice to meet you. Her grandmother, her mother, sorry, and her father died. And they've been married. I have no interest in going back and like recovering their remains. So, you know, so what I don't know is that was that a de novo mutation that rose in the grandmother? Or was it, was it, yeah, yeah. It's like, at some point the mutation had to occur because you, you go back and you, you look, I mean, it's a very, very rare mutation. There's no way that it was, it had to have arisen spontaneously, but we just don't know how to be
go for out to 10 years. Why three doesn't not get shut down because of this interpretation? They got shut down because they didn't comply. Not because of this interpretation. No, they just changed it. Because they didn't comply. It's because they were questioning the GTAP adaptation that they were able. Yeah, and they've been here since class. Oh, I say 30 rockets, it sounds like they're going to be No, there's not a program that's going to be a bunch of different things. It's like a bunch of different things. It's scary. And then all they were doing was recording. Right. So, they were just saying, but they have to say that they didn't have a niche for themselves in terms of the program. I'm just articulating one possible vision, but it's already been done. That's what we're doing. I want to go through it. 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 Can we carry uh, oh, yeah. stuff outside? Are we supposed to make you guys Oh, it's actually from a TED talk. That's awesome. I, that's such a great. Mm -hmm.